everybody. My name is Katrina Jenkins. I'm the Navajo County Emergency Manager and... And I'm Gary Strickland. I'm the Apache Sick Ridge National Forest Fire Chief. So we're here today to talk to you about fire restrictions. As you know, we're in stage one fire restrictions throughout the entire region. Gary, tell me what fire restrictions on the forest mean. Well, in, in general, fire restrictions, I want to start, they, they apply to not only our distant visitors, but our local visitors too. When we're in stage one fire restrictions, we're talking about two main things. We're banning campfires and we're banning smoking. So when I talk about a campfire, I'm talking about a fire that somebody would build with some kind of combustible material, whether that be wood, charcoal, coal, some kind of briquettes. And that really applies to dispersed campgrounds, those kind of scattered campgrounds across the forest that you know people kind of find in nooks and crannies. Um, when I talk about developed campgrounds, like kind of what you see here, it will, it's very apparent it has a, a built-in fire ring, grill, it's made out of metal. Now, don't be thinking that you can go to the store and buy a, a metal grill and put that out anywhere you want. That doesn't make it a, a, a developed campground. So, you know, if you if there's any doubt, if you're in a developed campground or dispersed, you can go on to the Apache Sick Ridge National Forest website. There's a list of all the approved developed campgrounds in there. That way it's safe. I encourage everybody to get on that website and look at that. How and then, easy. Then they know. Exactly, very easy. Easy to find. Absolutely. Developed campground, like you said, there's a ring, there's tables, so you kind of know that it's developed. Right. It's not in the wilderness. That's right. And that's the big difference for you, right? Yeah, the people have kind of gone out of their way to kind of manicure it. They've reduced the fuel loading outside of this so that if there were a spark that came from that campfire, the chances that it would start something are very, very minimal. Nice. Yeah. So the second part of that stage one restrictions is smoking. And what what we, we base it on is smoking is is not prohibited unless you're in a vehicle, an enclosed building, one of the developed campgrounds that we just talked about, or if you take the time and you clear out a three foot diameter and you're clearing out anything that could be combustible, then you can smoke in that little circle. Nice. So other than that, the big question I get about restrictions is fireworks and fireworks <laughs> are prohibited year round. There's not a day on the National Forest public land that you're allowed to have fireworks. Th thank you for that. That's, yeah. I mean, that's good information to have. No fireworks at any time on the National Forest. That's right. Good. So I'm kind of curious, what, what are the differences with restrictions off the forest? You know, we tried to make ours as similar to the forest restrictions as we could so that homeowners and visitors could kind of not be so confused. So you can have a campfire or a bonfire or fire pit in your backyard. I don't want to say a bonfire. That's not the right word because we don't want it too big. You got to keep them small mm -hmm. um, as long as it's in an area maintained and completely cleared of debris again. Mm -hmm. it's same thing with smoking. You can smoke outdoors as long as the area is completely, complete, completely co cleared of debris. And then, you know, that's those are the two big things. They're very similar to your restrictions as it is to our restrictions. And like you said, it doesn't matter if you live here and you're from here, or if you're at visiting or you're only a part-time resident. These rules apply to everybody whenever we're in those restrictions. So, yeah. So Gary, what are the penalties if someone gets caught violating the restrictions on the forest? So. Penalties can include up to $5,000 fine for, for single you know, violation. Uh, larger groups, uh, corporations, they can be looking at up to a $10,000 fine. And uh, to add on to that for both of them, you know, some, pe some people could be looking at up to six months in jail for, for violating that. I would add also that if that campfire gets out of the ring and starts a forest fire, those penalties are really nothing. Yeah. Um, you could be looking at suppression costs anywhere from thousands to millions of dollars to put that fire out. You know, and that's that's funny, because uh, again, we tried to do the same thing or as close to as we could. Our penalties you could, are as low as $250 for your first offense. They can go up to $2,500 in Navajo County and up to $750 in Apache County. And again, you can get charged with the suppression costs and if it damages another uh, home or property, 
anything like that, you're gonna be liable for that. So like you said, it could get up into the millions up here in some of these homes and areas. So you definitely wanna be more careful this time of year not to violate those restrictions. So um, one of the questions we hear a lot is, why don't we just close the forest? That's, that's a good question. And I, I get that question a lot too. And I, I, I understand why people would think that that is, you know, the, the best thing to do, but this is, this is public land and we're really trying to manage this land so that everybody can enjoy it. It's summertime. It's beautiful weather up in the White Mountains. You know, kids are out of school and you know, what a, what a great thing to do as a family, go out camping, enjoy the woods. You, and just introduce your children to just the marvels, you know, out in the forest. And so when we start looking at restrictions, we're really trying to keep an eye on you know, the conditions out there, uh, you know, whether it, how dry it is, uh, the fuel moistures, we're looking at past, present, future kind of weather conditions. We're looking at how many resources we have, what kind of resources are available. Do we have multiple fires going? You know, when we get a fire, what kind of fire behavior that is? Uh, what kind of resistance co to control? I mean, the list goes on and on. There are lots of things that we look at. It's not just a couple of things. And so by doing that, as those conditions start to worsen, that's when we start implementing these these restrictions, stage one, stage two. And we like to try to keep it that way where we're restricting some of the things that people are allowed to do on the forest, but they're still allowed to come and enjoy everything right. that we have to offer. Now, when we get into a, to a condition where things get so extreme that we're worried about the lives of the public and firefighters, that's when we start looking at forest closures. And so when we when we go into a forest closure, not only does that, does that affect the, the distant visitors that like to come up here, but it affects the local visitors yeah. and the local you know infrastructure and industry up here, which could include ranching, you know, logging, etc. So you know that that impacts the local community on many many different levels yeah. so making that closure decision we take that very very serious and we make sure that it's for the right reasons you know a lot of businesses rely on the income from our visitors and not to say that that's the only reason why we don't go into closures but it, it does have a big impact up here this is our livelihood to some folks and they rely on that, you know, for just a few short months to, to get them through the rest of the year. So, you know, one of the things that I hear a lot is, well, it's just too dry. You just need to shut it down. How many, how big is the National Forest? The Apache Sitgreaves National Forest? The, the Apache Sitgreaves National Forest is right around 2.2 million acres. Holy cow. It's pretty big. It's one of the biggest forests in Arizona. That's so huge. It's it's very big, yes. Okay, so two plus million acres. How many people do you have out patrolling those forest areas? Oh, at any given time, I would say we have between 50 and 60 people patrolling. 50 to 60 people, two plus million acres. That's right. So when people say, well, I never see anybody patrol, so I'm just gonna do this fire and I'll take my chances. What would you say to someone that said that? Well, like we talked about before, the chances and the, the stakes are pretty high. Um, yeah. We rely on our on our visitors to be very vigilant while they're in the forest. And, you know, they are the eyes and ears for our short workforce. They let us know what's yeah. going on out there. Uh, so we we really depend on those good folks visiting our forest to help us, you know. To be a these, steward. That's right, stewards of the land. Stewards of the land. We've got to, everybody's got to take their turn at being stewards of the land up here. Absolutely. Whether you own property or you're visiting, it's our responsibility to take care of this land. Absolutely. What else have we, do we need to talk about today? Again, I think one of the biggest things that I keep hearing is the two excuses of why those restrictions don't apply. One is our local folks that live here year round or might be vi part-time visitors say that the, the restrictions don't apply to me. I live here. That's for those people coming up to visit. And then vice versa, I hear very often that our visitors are saying that doesn't apply to me. I don't live here. 
The analogy I like to use the most, if you go to England, you're gonna drive on the left-hand side of the road because that's the law of the land. So the same goes up here. You have to follow the law of the land. So when we're in restrictions, it goes for everybody. So, you know, Gary, you've talked about the federal forest, Apache Sitgreaves federal forest lands. And I've been talking about homeowners and private property and, and in and around Navajo and Apache counties. There's other territories out there like... So all of our neighboring forests, we're adjacent to BIA, tribal lands. We're adjacent to the Coconino National Forest, the Tono National Forest. We have state land, there's BLM land. There's lots of different chunks of land out there. And so it's very important that when people are crossing from one area to another, they absolutely know where they're at, and what the rules are while they're in that area. Uh, we have some forests that have shooting restrictions and you, we don't have shooting restrictions on the Apache Sigreaves and you may go on the tunnel and they have shooting restrictions. You're gonna get in trouble if you shoot. So make sure you what? know what those restrictions are for the area you're in. Know before you go, right? Know before you go. Know before yeah. you go. And there's, there's plenty of resources out there. There's 311info.net. We've got lots of links there. You can find the restrictions links. You can go to the Apache Sitgreaves Forest website and they've got all the links to the different forests. Um, you know, there's our Facebook pages and we try to follow each other and share each other's information because we want you, our visitors and our, our homeowners and our, our local folks to have the best experience in our forests as possible while you're visiting the White Mountains or if you live in the White Mountains because this is a home and we want it to stay that way. It's too beautiful to let go. I know we, we were talking earlier about the, the, the violations and people getting cited. You know, last year I heard this and maybe you can help um, confirm or deny. There was about half and half. Half of the citations issued were for local residents and half were for visitors. Is that pretty standard? That's very true. Very true. It's, so uh, it's a common misconception that all the fires are started but from visitors that don't live here. Yep. And about 50% of our fires are started from our local community and the other 50 from outside. So everybody has to pay attention to what they're doing. Just because somebody lives here doesn't mean that they know exactly what they're doing. Right. And here's a good one for you, Gary. When is it okay to just walk away from a fire? Never. Just leave it. Never, never okay. Uh, not even. If you're in camp and you go take a nap, Fire's got to be out. Fire's got to go sleep out. At night, fire's got to be out. Go for a joy ride on your side by side or in your truck. Fire's got to be out. In your backyard, the fire's got to go yeah. out. If you're doing, if we weren't in restrictions and you were allowed to do debris burning, you can't walk away from that debris pile. You've got to make sure drown, stir, and feel. Make sure that that fire is cold to the touch before you walk away. How many fires do we have every year started by an abandoned fire? Dozens. 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 Yeah, probably close to 40 or 50 fires. And just think how many more man hours we could do patrolling versus fighting abandoned campfires. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, Gary, thank you for visiting with me in this beautiful campground. We're up here in Lakeside. Yeah, thanks it's for a gorgeous day. It's a little breezy. And, uh, you know, this was great. Yeah. I hope somebody gets a lot of information out of this. Thanks for visiting with us. Thank you.